An evolution of centuries-long efforts to contact and communicate with the dead, the practice of recording voices from the great beyond was attempted almost as soon as radio and tape recording technology became widely available in consumer devices. From garbled electronic chirps emanating out of swathes of white noise to perfectly clear, eloquent speech, the results across the years have been as varied as they have been numerous. Up there with the capturing of orbs on camera in regards to its plausibility, EVP research has somehow survived sceptical analysis and become a surprisingly persistent area of parapsychology. Though there were several pioneers in the space, there was one man who was supposedly so invested in the subject that by the time of his death, he decided to come back and continue the job from the afterlife through the medium of the telephone. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark History, Season 6, Episode 4. And it is actually Episode 4 this week. Uh, I, I said it was Episode 4 last week, but it was actually Episode 3 because apparently I don't really do counting. So, uh, yeah, anyway, this is Episode 4. I'm Ben, as always. We've got a really fun episode this week that is, um, I think, I thought I'd change it up a little bit because the last couple of weeks we've done those kind of true crime ones. And I kind of didn't mean to do two true crimey sort of murder mystery episodes in, in a row, so I thought I'd sort of mix it up a little bit and we got something that's a little bit paranormal but actually is a really big topic and I, I probably should have broached much sooner so yeah let's get straight into it this week's episode is Jurgensen Raudive and the history of EVP throughout history the process of death and dying has always been a defining subject promoting deep questions and interrogative metaphysical journeys one of the ways commonly experimented with has, throughout human history, been to attempt to contact those that have passed away, whether through direct communication or through more abstract and passive means. Tales of shamanism and necromancy date back at least to the ancient Greeks. Book 9 of Homer's Odyssey sees Odysseus travelling to the underworld and speaking with ghosts following an offering of sacrificial blood. Documentation from the Song Dynasty of China shows records of a practice known as Fuji, whereby the medium would hold a three-pronged stick of peach wood above a pit of sand, allowing a spirit to direct one of the prongs, sketching out writing onto the surface, one symbol at a time, an assistant smoothing the sand after each one was put down. By the Middle Ages, necromancy and folk shamanism was used throughout Europe to aid in solving crimes, to divine harvests and to solve small issues in a community. However, the Catholic Church, with its enthusiasm to eradicate folk religion, eventually condemned any practice which sought to communicate with the dead. As far as they were concerned, any form of resurrection or communication with spirits could only have been undertaken by God himself. It stood to reason, then, that any earthly human dabbling in the art was therefore toying with the demons. Dubbed as Maleficium, the most infamous examples of retribution for the accused were the widespread witch trials that spread to all corners of Europe and across the ocean to North America throughout the early modern period. In the 19th century, spiritualism saw a massive rise in attempts to communicate with the dead, along with a massive bump in the belief that such a thing was even possible. The American Fox sisters led the line by communicating with spirits and channeling their answers through a series of knocks and bangs before graduating to full-on mediumship that, despite being uncovered and later admitted to having been a fairly crude hoax, they nevertheless managed to pull the wall over the eyes of an entire generation and catapulted spiritualism headlong into public attention. Following their death, mediumship and the practice of seances only continued to grow with table tipping, spirit writing and channeling all being common methods of communicating with the dead, before the invention, growing use and eventual publication of the Ouija board into wider society, which was stamped and patented in 1891. By the late 19th century, discoveries and advancements in all fields of science were striking through society, many showing hard results in areas that to the average Joe appeared to be magical and otherworldly. Germ theory shone a light into an unseen universe, whilst electromagnetism demonstrated the existence of invisible forces and radio and telegraphy sent messages through the air halfway around the world. If telegraphy were possible, why not telepathy? It may seem like an unreasonable jump in logic today, but at the time it was a more or less sane question to ruminate upon and many of the greatest minds spent a degree of time considering the possibility of speaking without words across the planes of existence. Whilst mediumship 
and traditional seances soared, the more traditional methods used only served as a dense backdrop to more pseudo-scientific, esoteric and decidedly experimental methods. In the early 20th century, Thomas Edison, the American inventor whose hand had been involved in hundreds of technological advancements, including, famously, the electric light, dabbled in a far more occult-like device, which he dubbed the Spirit Telephone. At one time, thought to be an elaborate hoax, the inventor had in fact turned a pragmatic eye towards spirit communication, looking to move it out of the vague, wishy-washy world of mediums and squarely into a scientific platform. He documented the complicated theory he possessed about how humans were made up of swarms of tiny life forms and of how he intended to build a device to contact these life forms after a person's death. In an interview with Forbes in the American magazine on the 16th of October 1920, he said, I have been at work for some time building an apparatus to see if it is possible for personalities which have left this earth to communicate with us. If this is ever accomplished, it will be accomplished not by any occult, mystifying, mysterious or weird means, such as are employed by so-called mediums, but by scientific methods. Edison, who was 73 years old at the time, never produced a device, at least not publicly, but there are admittedly somewhat unreliable rumours that persist, telling of a secret meeting with a group of unnamed scientists, suggesting that he was doing more than just theorising on the possibilities. Outside of Edison's somewhat underplayed spirit phone. Experiments in radio and amplified sound had been underway almost since the invention of radio itself, with people dabbling with the concept, attempting to utilise radio waves as a medium to contact the dead. Just like Edison, many of these experimenters were interested in contacting the dead using purely scientific means. They hoped to utilise machines in order to solve the question of life after death once and for all, without any fluffy mediums, who, for many, were an area of spiritualism that had a painfully poor track record when it came to honesty and hoaxes. To these scientifically minded pioneers, they held strong to the faith that you could trust a machine. Its cold metal construction had no motive, thoughts or feelings of its own, therefore it would have no reason or ability to create fake communications. As an inanimate object, they saw it as a completely objective tool. Of course, to do so, they had to ignore completely the many proven hoaxes that had come and gone in the world of spirit photography. But why let such facts stand in the way of a good theory? One of the earliest pioneers in the experimentation of utilising recorded sound to communicate with the dead was, coincidentally enough, an American practitioner of spirit photography who fostered ambitions of branching out into the audible realm, named Attila von Zale. Von Zale, working in collaboration with Los Angeles-based psychologist Raymond Bayliss, constructed a purpose-built cabinet equipped with a microphone and record lathe, which he later upgraded to a tape recorder. The whole thing resembled, in essence, something like a modern-day recording booth that he would sit inside in the hopes that the microphones would capture the voices that he heard, constantly whispering around him in his everyday life. The pair claimed to have recorded some degree of success, capturing short sentences in both male and female voices. A reader of the American Journal for Psychical Research, where some of their results were published in 1959, would have been excused for raising an eyebrow when they were presented with such otherworldly expressions as Hot Dog Art, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all, and This is G. Unsurprisingly, their work failed to set the world on fire, and it would prove to be another decade before research into spirit recordings would begin to mature fostering a community of researchers and becoming a recognised path of investigation. Right at the fore, steering the ship in its earliest days, was a man named Friedrich Jörgensen, a Swedish artist with a penchant for birdsong, an impressive command of languages and a certain degree of eccentricity. Born in February 1903, Friedrich Jörgensen had a fairly cosmopolitan upbringing. His physician father was Danish, whilst his mother was Swedish, and though he was born in Odessa, he schooled in a German language institution in Russia. Favouring the arts over following his father into medicine, he studied painting before moving into vocal training to become an opera singer at the Odessa Conservatory. In 1925, he relocated with his family to Estonia before moving to Berlin to continue his education as a singer. After his teacher fled to Palestine in 1932, Jürgensen followed in order to maintain his training. However, following the Second World War, 
He dropped what was beginning as a successful career on stage due to illness and instead dedicated himself to painting. He moved to Sweden and married a Swedish national and became a citizen himself whilst continuing to work as an artist. His work afforded him several unique jobs and opportunities, one in particular as a documentary artist for an archaeological survey in Pompeii where his work caught the eye of the Vatican and saw him painting a series of portraits of Pope Pius XII. Following a bout of pneumonia, he settled in Stockholm with his wife and spent his days painting between there and the family's countryside cottage amongst the forests and lakes of Melbo on the southwest outskirts of Stockholm. It was an event that happened whilst he was at the cottage on June the 12th, 1959, that would go on to shape the rest of his life, changing his course and facing it in a much more peculiar direction. That summer, he'd intended to spend a relaxed few months at the rural cottage and had bought a large reel-to-reel tape recorder with the purpose of recording the varied and continuous birdsong. Setting the recorder up on a desk by the window, he carefully placed the tape reel onto the spindle and hit the record button. I checked the recording after the tape ran for about five minutes. What I heard was very strange. I was hearing a roaring or hissing static sound, like a shower, in which you could identify the chirping of the finch, but it was as if coming from a distance. My first thought was that one of the tubes was damaged during the trip. Nevertheless, I turned the recorder on again and let the tape run. My second recording was just like before. I was hearing this strange hissing and the distant bird chirping. Then all of a sudden, there sounded a trumpet solo, as if to announce something. I listened with continued surprise, as suddenly, a male voice began to speak in Norwegian. Though it was very quiet, I could clearly understand the words. The man was talking about bird songs at night, and I heard a number of chattering, whistling and splashing sounds, and among them, what seemed to be the chirping of a sparrow. Suddenly, the bird choir fell silent, and with that, so did the hissing sound. In the next instant, the twittering of a finch was audible, and in the distance, you could hear a titmouse. The tape recorder was working perfectly again, but what had actually happened? The fact was totally clear to me. This was a Norwegian radio broadcast, but the only radio receiver we had was left back in the house, and it was not turned on. Fascinated by the mysterious words that had stumbled into his recordings, Jürgensen forgot all about the birds and instead, he set up his tape recorder again, looking to hone in on the phantom voices. It wasn't for a whole month before he successfully captured them for a second time. On the night of the 12th of July, sitting at his desk, he'd switched on the recorder and watched the control light on the side that flashed when it was picking up any audible sound to record. It was dark and quiet in the room, and I started to become sleepy. Then something happened that left me wide awake. Suddenly, the control lamp started to flash, flicker and twitch, and to go out completely, then start flickering again. Something was coming in on that tape that one should be able to hear. I was standing by the tape recorder, tense and impatient. As the flashing stopped, and then I listened during the replay of the tape, it turned out to be very little that I could clearly perceive because a vibrating roar made it difficult to listen. That evening, I was too tired, and I decided to check the recording again a little closer the next morning. As he sat there listening to the recordings of static and noise, slowly he started making sense of words garbled in the fuzz. Tsar region, we must springtime speak about. Friedrich, you are being observed. Friedrich, when you translate and interpret into German during the day, try to solve the truth every evening with the ship. With the ship in the dark. At the time, Jürgensen was researching the Russian Tsarist Empire for a book that he'd been writing, and so the voices, speaking in English and German, appeared to make a degree of sense. They'd even called out his name. Perhaps, most excitingly, the curiously composed sentence had been thrown out after a single word in English. Churchill. Excited, Jürgensen scooped up the tape recorder and took it up into the attic where the room was quieter and he could record with less danger of picking up outside interference, including from his wife who was trying to sleep in the room below. He hit record, let the tape run for a period and then wrapped up for the night, late as it was. The next day, he went into town and purchased a set of headphones that would allow him to listen in to the microphone of the recorder as it was in use, effectively allowing him to hear the recordings as they were being made in real time. 
The next recordings he made were punctuated by a telephone call and as he went downstairs to answer the call, he left the tape running. Whilst he spoke on the phone, Carino, his dog, ran up the stairs to the attic where the tape recorder was. Afraid that the dog would interfere with the recordings, he hastily rang off on the call and leapt up the stairs, seeing the dog calmly sitting in his chair next to the desk by the radio. The dog running up to the radio by itself was a peculiar situation. However, it all became more strange when he listened to the tape deck back and heard voices calling the dog's name buried in the static. His recordings until now had excited him, thrilled him like an adventure that was all too rare in most people's ordinary lives. Listening back to the voice calling out Carino in a whisper was the final spark that ensured his life was about to change direction entirely. The painting and the writing would have to wait. It was the voices that needed his attention now. And just like that, Jürgensen dedicated the rest of his life to chasing the voices in the static. Einspielung 32 Jürgensen continued to record voices on a tape recorder over the following years. Years which were, at first, full of turmoil and struggle as he came to terms with what he dubbed a considerable measure of stress and challenge as he acted as both pioneer and guinea pig, recording important messages, sometimes even directed towards his dog Carino, like, Snout, are you blind? For a while, Jürgensen connected the voices with UFO phenomena and in a state of bitter confusion and despair, he gave up on the voices and turned his back on the recordings. He locked the tape recorder, along with all of his tapes in a cupboard, closed up the cottage and drove back to Stockholm, determined to put an end to his research. Things changed, however, when one day he began to hear the voices in his daily life, even without the tape recorder. It started with a strange sound phenomena being audible around me during the course of the day. For example, when I was sitting in my studio listening to the splashing of the rain, I could clearly hear short calls, words or partial words, yes, among them even longer sentences that originated from the drizzle or rain dropping sounds from the water and that were whispered undeniably by a female voice. For the most part, the sentences repeated themselves and were spoken sometimes in German and sometimes in Swedish and they went something like, hold contact with the equipment, hold contact, Please listen. Daily contact with equipment. Please, please listen. The same words were even audible in the crackling of the stove fire or in the rustling of paper. There was no doubt for me that this was truly a sound phenomena and not my imagination because I could clearly recognise the sound and character of the same female voice that had been heard on my tapes on many occasions. Quite rightly, Jorgensen began feeling concerned for his own health, suspecting schizophrenia. The only thing that kept him from considering himself completely crazy at the time was the knowledge that if the tapes had recorded the voices, then they could not have been only in his head, and therefore he must have been as mentally sound as he felt. He had been focusing on the voices on the tapes for almost a year, and now, after he had withdrawn from the pursuit, he found a void had appeared, and within the void, the voices still teased him in everyday sounds, the raindrops on the window, the sound of his electric razor, and in the whistle of the wind. It was during one evening where he was considering his situation when he heard a faint voice, as he had started to become accustomed to, whispering, Listen to me, take part in the work, which he decided was a call for him to work with the voices again, and so he went and broke out his tape recorder. Thrilled by the ghostly invitation, he immediately recommenced with his research, unpacking his tape recorder and going in search of the mystery voices. In December of 1959, Jürgensen decided to reach out to the Swedish psychiatrist, neurologist and parapsychologist Dr. John Bjorkham, who had done research into hypnosis and hallucinations, publishing books on the subject internationally. 
After a pleasant conversation over the phone, Jorgensen arranged for a gathering at his home where he could demonstrate the tape recording phenomena to him. He also invited Arne Weiss, a radio producer from the Swedish Broadcasting Company, along with his sister and sister-in-law who had been staying at his home over Christmas. Things didn't go particularly well, and Jorgensen came to realise that such gatherings were not altogether useful, as they relied too heavily on the voices appearing at just the right time in order to demonstrate their existence. If they failed to arrive, then scepticism was always quick to follow. In the spring of 1960, a breakthrough came in the recordings that was significantly changed the way forward for Friedrich, who by now was fully dedicating his time to his search for the other side. He had made several recordings where music or radio broadcasts were playing in the background and had noticed how they had been successful. Eventually, he got the idea to plug the radio into the recorder directly and use the radio static to assist him in producing recorded voices. And as soon as he did so, he met who he called his radio assistant, the voice of a woman named Lena, who he said guided him to the correct wavelength with which to tune a radio in order to pick up the voices. Helpful as this might sound, she spoke at a speed that it was required to listen to the recording at around half the speed to make sense of it at all, and in such a way as to make it sound, in Jürgensen's exact words, like a toneless, meaningless hissing, which is perhaps fairly unsurprising. With the realisation that Lena was there to help him, the auditory hallucination he had been suffering over the previous months in the air around him vanished completely leading him to theorise that she had been trying to direct him to the radio technique all along. At this point, things get more than a little unusual for Jürgensen, who had decided to stay on at his cottage at Mongbo, alone after a family break over the Easter holiday, in order to continue his research into recording radio broadcasts. He'd purchased a new recorder and radio for the job, and installed it in the cottage, and immersed himself into the task at hand, where he was truly making some groundbreaking revelations, recording the voices of Hitler, as well as those of Churchill, Goering, who gave his messages in song, and his mother. Things started to get all very metaphysical and abstract when he was given information on the structure of the other side, which he said consisted of several layers or astral regions where different spirits existed. He learned that he could visit these regions not only in a physical sense through his radio, but also through the practice of astral projection in his sleep. To say descriptions of his life were becoming more and more abstract is something of an understatement. Lena began reading his mind and answers came onto the recordings without Jürgensen having to ask the questions verbally. Things continued much in the same vein for about eight years with Jürgensen filling 140 tapes with over 6,000 messages including the voices of Stalin, Hitler, Trotsky, Lenin, Van Gogh, Annie Besson D'Annunzio, Goering, Himmler and Hilda Goebbels. In June of 1963, in the run-up to both his first and the world's first published book on the subject of EVPs, titled Voices from Space, he held a seven-hour-long press conference where he laid out his theories and then had a number of heated debates on whether or not he was being entirely serious. He also put out a call to scientists, audio experts and professional broadcasters, inviting them to visit his cottage in Mongbo, which he intended to turn into a purpose-built studio. He also nominated himself for a Nobel Peace Prize, and whilst he may have been reaching a touch on that front, his obsessive research into the voices and the demonstrations, collaborations and publications that followed firmly cemented him as one of the earliest pioneers of electronic voice phenomena and instrumental transcommunication. In 1964, one of the many doctors, professors and audio experts that visited Mongbo was a Latvian psychologist named Konstantin Raudave, who was, at that time, also living in Sweden. He had read Jürgensen's book, and become entranced by the concept of the recorded voices, and was ready to get involved himself. Einspielung 33. Born in Latvia in 1909, Konstantin Raudave's earliest years were fairly rough. 
born into the peasant class, his educational life was like Jürgensen's, fairly cosmopolitan and punctuated with large upheaval, bouncing from country to country. He studied psychology in France, Germany, Scotland and Switzerland, where he was a student of Carl Jung, as well as spending time in Finland and Spain. Prior to the war, he worked as the editor of a Latvian daily newspaper before taking on the role of professor of psychology at the University of Riga, where he met and married his wife, Zenta Morina, a Latvian literary critic, translator and literature professor, in 1935. Following the Second World War, he fled to Uppsala in Sweden, where he and Zenta lectured as guest professors until the mid-1960s, when they moved to Bad Kronzingen in Germany. Raudave read Friedrich Jürgensen's 1964 book, Voices from Space. Initially sceptical, he thought many of his conclusions were formed by a vivid imagination, the kind that could conjure up pictures in an empty room or voices out of stillness. Despite that initial feeling, he still seemed to find the idea fascinating all the same, and an aching curiosity led him to contact Jürgensen to arrange a meeting. He travelled to Jürgensen's studio in Nissand, where the pair conducted several recordings, and though the results were not documented in any detail, Jürgensen commented that they were a great success, with several messages being directed personally to Raudave. Over the following year, the pair collaborated several times, changing Raudave's opinion on Jürgensen entirely, whom he now considered utterly sincere. The voices that Raudave heard during this time was spoken in Latvian, German and English, and seemed to come from a recently deceased acquaintance of Raudave's. Whatever they recorded in those meetings, it was apparently enough to convince Raudave, who by June of 1965 had decided to set up a small studio for himself in order to remove Jürgensen from the equation. His theory was that by simplifying the chain of communication, there would be less confusion and more clarity, as well as proving that no particular medium need be involved. Raudave, much like his predecessor, immersed himself in the research of the recorded voices. His start was a slow one, and he found that results were not so quick to come by. It took him close to three months before his first success, a faint voice in Latvian that uttered the words, That is right. In fact, Raudave returned to his early recordings in later months and found that he had actually recorded many more messages than he had first realised. He realised that in those early months, he simply had not trained his hearing to receive the messages at the time. Many of the messages sounded so strange at first and spoke with an unaccustomed pitch as well as having strange modes of expression, such that Raudave concluded it took an ordinary person several months to train themselves to hear them with any confidence, though he did admit that in his research, inviting others to listen to his recordings, he found that people trained in music, military radio operations, Catholic priests, and perhaps most oddly, specialists in internal diseases, could all pick out and understand the voices much faster than, on average, others who had heard the tapes. He categorised the results into three different groups, A, B and C, with group A being the clearest recordings that anyone could hear with no special training, down to group C, which took extensive training to make out the voices correctly and which, he theorised, may even require future technological advancements in order to gain a greater understanding. Typically, it was these difficult-to-understand messages which he suggested had the most detailed information, with much paranormal data. In essence, much of Raudave's experimentation followed directly from the results that Jürgensen had already discovered and he equally came to similar conclusions. Raudave, however, was interested in making them easier to hear, and so he set about constructing new methods to record the sounds. By the end of his career with the voices, he utilised three different main methods. The first of which was very similar to those carried out by Jürgensen, where he plugged a microphone into a tape recorder and recorded the sounds of the environment. This, he wrote, gave varied results that were often made more difficult by many people in the room who may have been talking throughout. He then had two other flavours of radio recording, one where he recorded the radio directly and another where he recorded the radio through a microphone. The latter of these methods he discovered accidentally one day whilst carrying out a recording that picked up a radio in an entirely different room. Perhaps Raudave's greatest advancement in recording technology, however, came with his diode recording device, which was essentially a small length of aerial wire, about 6 to 8 centimetres in length, attached to a simple electronic circuit containing a diode. 
This differed from any method utilising a microphone by eliminating any ambient noise in the room. In theory, capturing any voices that the aerial was to pick up directly to tape. In truth, the device would more than likely pick up a whole barrel full of white noise. Through these methods, Raudave was able to collect tens of thousands of messages during his career researching the phenomena, including the voice of his own mother, whom he said used his nickname to address him on several occasions, as well as his aunt, who gave him several warnings, such as, Here is Costi, here is aunt. Don't tire yourself. My hair has been cut off. His elder sister and brother, who had both died previously, were a little more helpful, giving cryptic messages about their existence in another realm. Outside of family members, Raudave collected messages from a host of friends and acquaintances and hundreds of writers, artists, politicians, philosophers and psychologists, several of whom were long dead, including Leo Tolstoy, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who advised Raudave against moving to America to practice mediumship, Friedrich Nietzsche, Carl Jung, Winston Churchill, who rather poignantly exclaimed that radio on earth is scandalous, Joseph Stalin was there, and of course Adolf Hitler, who gave Raudave so much material, he said that he could have written an entire book just with his messages alone. With so many voices coming through on the tapes, Raudave decided to choose only the most forward-coming voices, those who freely divulged their names and information, and tried to foster relationships with each one in order to get the best information. By the time of his death in 1974, he'd recorded over 100,000 tapes, involving over 400 experts from both sides of the belief spectrum. For Raudave's part, he had made his conclusions long before his death and published his thoughts in his 1971 book, Breakthrough, An Amazing Experiment in Electronic Communication with the Dead. My research has led me to the personal conclusion that apart from the biological, physical level on which we human beings here exist, there is a second level, that of the physical, spiritual being, whose potentialities are only released after death. Jürgensen, who despite not being directly included in Raudave's research anymore, remained in contact and analysed many of his results and recordings, which he also concluded with positive confidence. After eight years of experience in this field of research, I found it very rewarding to recognise the same phenomena I had investigated, showing the same characteristic polyglot traits. Dr. Raudave's recordings, which I examined with great care, confirm in an entirely objective manner the unique contact that has been established with a hitherto unknown plane of existence, which, perhaps, we may call the beyond, or the higher life dimension. The fact that Dr. Raudave's questions received clear and unequivocal answers from the voice entities, as if a telephone link had been established, is enough in itself to indicate that a direct contact exists. I found that some of the male and female voices which appear frequently in my own recordings manifested also in Dr. Raudave's experiments. There can be no doubt whatsoever that the phenomena manifesting in Dr. Raudave's experiments is the same that manifests in my own. The methods used are different, but this is really a great advantage, for it seems that the same phenomena appears when different techniques are applied in experiments. Summarising both men's research into the phenomena, Jürgensen wrote, with no small amount of pomp, that I can state with the utmost conviction and certainty, these messages stem without doubt from our so-called dead. They are able to manifest on tape, with the help of electromagnetic impulses, frequencies or waves. The dead are trying to stabilise this new line of communication, and it is our task to help them by developing the technical means, thereby 
promoting clarity and a deeper understanding of the phenomena. For the first time in the history of mankind, a contact has been established through which objective proof of post-mortal life can be obtained. This is an epoch-making event of the greatest significance. To solve the problem of death is to solve all of our other problems, for it gives us the key to our mystery of our existence, immortality. Between them, both Jürgensen and Raudave contributed significantly to the emerging realm of what would later become known as electronic voice phenomena and instrumental transcommunication, helping to bring it to a far wider audience. However, if 100,000 tapes seemed like a lot, it was apparently not enough for Raudave, who, through a strange twist of fate, would return to continue his work from the other side eight years after his death. At least, if the recordings of a researcher and founder of the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena are to be believed. Born in 1926 in Pennsylvania, USA, Sarah Estep had grown up with somewhat more exposure to a human's mortality than most children. Her grandmother was the director of a funeral home and Sarah would stay with them several times throughout the year, surrounded by grieving families and, of course, the dead bodies that were placed on full view during the ceremonies. Traumatised by the concept that life would eventually come to an end for us all, she found herself steering headlong into a lifetime of research into the possibility of some form of existence after death. She turned first to reincarnation, where she worked with people who claimed to have had past life experiences, though she found herself sceptical of many of their claims. It was in 1976 that she would discover a book that would shape the latter half of her life and give her research a new direction when she stumbled across a book named the Handbook of Psy Discoveries in a local library that detailed the research undertaken by Friedrich Jürgensen and Constantine Raudave during the earliest years of EVP discovery. Much in the way the voices of the dead had transfixed both men in the past, Sarah too found herself fascinated and immediately set to work on her own experiments. Dusting off her husband's old reel-to-reel tape recorder, she sat down with a ropey microphone and headphones that only worked in one ear and hit record asking out loud, is anybody there? She would follow it up with a second question. Who is here? And finally, where are you? It was a rude awakening that capturing the voices of the dead was not so easy, as she played the tape back only to hear the hissing of a silent room. She repeated the same process for six days, two hours in the morning and two at night, with no success, before she decided to change things up. Finally, on the morning of the sixth day, I stopped asking the same three questions. If anyone was listening, I reasoned, that person must be as bored as I was. For the first time, I asked, what is your world like? A short time later, when I played the tape back, I heard a clear voice answering my question about another world with the word beauty. Contact had been made. It was the hit that she had been hoping for, though she was not convinced that the voice had been of paranormal origin. Much like Jürgensen and Raudave before her, she dove headlong into the search to discover more about the voices, recording tape after tape. In contrast to her predecessors, however, she made it a conscious effort not to attempt to contact any famous spirits, as she put it in her book that if she were to hear the voice of Julius Caesar, how would she be able to have them prove such a claim? From time to time, however, the famous did come through, uninvited, and she found herself communicating with Beethoven, who played her music, that nobody seemed to recognise. In 1982, she founded the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena with the lofty goal to provide objective evidence that we survive physical death in our individual conscious state. Twelve years later, she found herself, along with four other paranormal researchers, George Meek, Mark Macy, Walter Uphoff and Hans Heckman, speaking directly to Raudave who had taken to making telephone calls to them from beyond the grave. My telephone rang normally. I was sitting at the desk in my office working. When I picked up the receiver, a clear male voice said, This is Constantine Radeve. I quickly pushed the record button of my Sano tape recorder that is connected to my telephone and asked, How are you, Dr. Radeve? This explains his first remark as my tape recorder began recording. I'm as fine as a dead one can be. I'm as fine as a dead one can be. 
Dear Sarah, thank you very much for everything you did for the propagation of the voices. Uh, we tried and we succeeded in building this bridge to the States. You are one of the first to are contacted by this meaning. Thank you very much for all the work you did. We are very proud and honored that we could contact you. I must interrupt now. This was the first contact. This was Constantin Rodriguez was speaking. Thank you so much. Mark Macy, one of the founding members of the International Network for Instrumental Transcommunication, claimed that Raudave spoke to him on the phone several times, sometimes for up to 15 minutes, and at one point actually gave him detailed technical advice on how to set up his radio. Macy believed that, since his death, Raudave had been charged with the calling to continue the development of ITC systems from the other side of the veil. Infighting, scepticism and clashes of ego, personality and belief put a premature end to the research being conducted over the phone with Raudave, with Sarah Estep returning to her own tape recordings and some of the less sceptical disappearing down a very peculiar rabbit hole that bordered on cult religion. Before her death in 2008 due to kidney failure, Sarah Estep published two books on her years of research, Voices of Eternity and Roads to Eternity. The American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena lives on under a new name of Association Transcommunication, where they continue to publish research related to EVP, with researchers still continuing to make contact with Constantine Raudave, who uses the code phrase LIGHT22 to let them know it is he who is communicating, supplying them with messages, ensuring them that he will never give up his efforts to prove survival via transcommunication. As far as the sceptical voice is concerned, electronic voice phenomena is little more than the fallibility of auditory perception mixed with pseudoscience and a poor understanding of the practices of audio recording. One of the first flags raised is upon that of the state of the recordings themselves. It's no surprise that many examples of EVP throughout the generations have come from poor quality recordings. In fact, when capturing recordings today, Many of the guides online specifically instruct wannabe ghost hunters to utilise poor quality recorders that are further hampered by ear bleeding noise flaws and artefact inducing compression when they are turned up to full volume. Of course, just like Jurgensen and Raudave theorised, a little noise in the background oftentimes leads to good results. Raudave suggested it helped to carry the voices, however with such practices it becomes all too easy to poke holes in the method. Perhaps the biggest argument against this practice is that the voices that people are hearing are nothing more than a trick of the mind. Known as pareidolia, it is the human ability to give meaning and shape to what is seemingly random and ambiguous. See Maxwell Seed, the Honorary Secretary of the Society for Psychical Research, once regaled a story to David Ellis, a Cambridge graduate and sceptic of Raudave's work, in which a test was carried out upon a group of subjects who were each asked to transcribe what they were told was a poor quality tape recording of a lecture. Many of the subjects returned pages full of notes, from random words to full sentences, despite the fact that the tape contained nothing but white noise. In his book on the subject of Raudave, David Ellis concluded that he believed that often Raudave merely mistook fragments of foreign radio broadcasts, faintly garbled from poor reception, for the voices of the dead. Whilst he conceded that some of the voices were difficult to explain without a paranormal angle, most of them were of too poor quality to prove positive identification. Apophenia is another suggested theory for why people find meaning in what is essentially randomness. The ability to link one seemingly random word to another to create sentences and patterns was seen in both Jurgensen and Raudave's work. With both parties speaking several languages, it was even more likely that they would find meaning where there was none. Outside of apophenia, it was simply far easier for both men to pinch a word or two from the other given their expanded vocabularies. Both conclusions frankly make considerable more sense than the possibility that ghosts were mashing sometimes as many as five or six languages, often that they had no ability to speak whilst they were living, into a single poorly constructed sentence. Furthermore, many of the sentences, short as they were, meant very little on the surface. 
it was only after a meaning was extrapolated, oftentimes using some pretty substantial liberties and no small amount of projection, that anything even began to make sense. In counter, Raudavay believed that some unknown force was imposing itself upon the voices, forcing them to speak in peculiar rhythms and tones, which were, in turn, forcing the improper grammatical structures and multiple languages, though he appeared to offer no explanation as to what this force might be, nor how Winston Churchill learned to speak several languages after his death. Today, EVP is an absurdly popular area of paranormal research, popularised by ghost hunting adventure programmes broadcast the world over on late night cable TV. Just as it was in the early days with the Ergenson and Raudave, it is an ever more accessible method of communicating with the dead that cuts out the supernatural role of the spirit medium and places the power in the hands of everyday people. Though there is a certain fetishization of the mid-century radio technology that proved so successful before, the realm has kept up with technological advancements, and there are now thousands of gadgets, gizmos and apps, all of which claim to assist one in contacting the dead, each with more dubious claims than the last. Like many areas of parapsychology, it's an area of investigation plagued by hoaxes, chances, and those that have been all too willing to bend the truth. There has also, however, been many who were just as sincere, who, if nothing else, held a strong degree of faith in the belief that all they were seeking was the truth. When looking back at the history of EVPs, it can be all too easy to poke holes in the methods, point out the many areas of eccentricity, or the moments when practitioners did little more than fudge the truth. Perhaps the kindest conclusions we can draw are that Jürgensen, Raudafe, Estep and Co were pioneers of a subject in its earliest days and as such, they were prone to pitfalls and errors, as those on the bleeding edge so often are. The sceptic, however, might suggest that they weren't really prone to the pitfalls, but tumbling down them with gleeful abandon. So there we go, EVPs. Yeah, quite a bit to talk about on this, I guess, after these short advert breaks. Welcome back. So yeah, EVPs. I, I'm going to say right off the bat, and you've, you you might have noticed um, already. I I don't believe in EVPs at all for a second. Um, there's just far for me. There's just far too much against it, and I've spent probably far too much time recording audio. I've seen examples over and over again, and I and I and I and I understand why they're there. That I can't see. Um, EVPs as, as anything serious. Um, I mean, I, I've been recording, like to give some examples, I've been recording audio since probably like the early 90s um, when I got into like recording music. Um, and, you know, I, some of my earliest recordings were like these just janky little kind of microphones chucked in front of like really cheap mic um, amplifiers that I had when I was a kid. These, these, these recordings would be like just full of like distortion and noise and of course it was the early 90s so I was well into like grunge and stuff and you know I was recording like just distorted guitars everywhere really poorly and and you know you hear like mad stuff in that when when you're listening to it back and especially when you start messing with the the bands and and like using things like compression and stuff like that that it's just it, I just can't believe it. I, when I was in a band a little while back, we had a, a recording studio like where we practiced and stuff, and it was underneath a um, great big like uh, viaduct uh, that the train for, ran through the city on, and it, it was underneath one of the arches of this viaduct. So the, the train was about you know good like a hundred meters up in the air probably, and yet whenever the train was sort of on its way, we always knew. And sometimes even when a train wasn't in its way, we always knew there was something going on um, on the train tracks because the amps in the room would pick up these crazy, spooky ghost noises. You just hear this mad sound. And it was coming from the electricity of the train tracks. You know, like the the, the, the magnets in the back of the speakers, I guess, were like picking it all up. So, you, you know, you'd hear this stuff. And, and I admit fully, like I, that recording studio, the first time we heard it, creeped us all out because we were like what the hell is this noise until we kind of worked out what was going on it was a really creepy noise because it wasn't there's no way I can really explain it to you like how it sounded because it, it was really a unique weird 
ghostly kind of whispering sound that, that would happen whenever, basically whenever we weren't playing music, we just hear this weird noise. So I've heard too much stuff like that in my life to know that it just can't, that it, it just can't be true. I'm sorry. It just, I just don't believe it. Um, and not only that, but I, I see so much from the EVP community, microphones they suggest to record these EVPs with. Like, it's so funny to me. Like, they, they say, oh, you know, these are the best ones that you can buy on the market for picking up EVPs. And and they're all like, you know, I, we don't know why, but they're really good at picking up EVPs. Well, i tell you why. It's because they're poor quality. Once you understand the you know, concept of compression and, and, and noise floors and, and digital artifacts, all this EVP stuff just completely falls apart because you don't need very much when you're recording audio to create distortions, strange harmonics, anomalies. You know, all of this stuff comes out of a perfectly clear recording with just a little bit of like multi-brand compression or, you know, a, a, a little bit of compression here or there. Even DSing, you know, like can change something considerably. So, you know, I, I just... In me, I'm, I'm far too sceptical. Having said all that, I still love that they exist and I still love that people research them and I still love, like, you know, this, uh, listening to them. And, 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 and sometimes they just make me laugh and they're very funny. And, and other times it's, you know, that they are interesting. Like, like I'll be honest, I wrote this episode and I found Raudavan Jürgensen quite funny. Like, you know, hot dog art. And this is G. I mean, what does any of this mean? None of it means anything. And 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 again, like to, to sort of go back to being sceptical again, Raudavay and Jürgensen were, were imparting all this meaning onto these phrases that didn't that, that had none. So they would be like, oh, you know, hot dog art, and then they would come off with why this means something. And it, and you and you think, yeah, it means something now because you've just like like given it meaning by by this kind of weird convoluted mate you've put an awful lot of your own sort of experience onto that to give it meaning before that it meant nothing and and and, and honestly i found their books full of that and and to be completely honest i found jürgensen's book a little bit sad to read because genuinely it it, it was quite sad for a period when he wasn't sure what was going on and and to be honest it sounded like you know it was almost like reading the book of a man sliding into uh, uh, some sort of episode you know I'm, I'll always say I'm, I'm not going to be one to armchair diagnose people in it because I just don't know enough about that kind of stuff but to me it was it was really you know that he was sort of talking about how he's hearing these voices every day and in like the, the rain on the window and stuff and you're thinking like Dude, you're you're either unwell or just really obsessed about this, or you know, like desperate to find meaning in this. Maybe, you know, it could have just been something something as simple as that. And, and you know, like the the real thing that sort of to me like said it all was when he said that he found his um his radio guide called Lena, and Lena was like you know there to help him, but she was so difficult to hear that even he admitted that she basically sounded like a bunch of nonsense hissing, and and it's like yeah. Yeah, she did. And there's a reason for that. I think it's a little bit too easy to misunderstand what it is you've they've recorded. And I think it's a little bit too easy to project a meaning onto that. And and I just think it's a little bit too easy for to then use that as a way to kind of forward your agenda, which of course is to prove that, you know, there's life after death. But so for me, I yeah, I, I mean to call me a skeptic on this thing would be putting it lightly. So that said, the history of this is brilliant. I loved it. I, I really enjoyed the history of it. And I thought it was a really interesting um, episode to, to make. And and reading, say, like it, despite the fact that I kind of felt a bit bad for Jürgensen, who to me came across as a man who was, say, like a little bit desperate and looking for a meaning in, in things that just weren't there. And it, he really goes off on one and, and sort of falls down a rabbit hole as well. And, and it's just a bit weird honestly. Um, but I, I still found his research really interesting. And Jürgensen, uh, and sorry, Raudave, I found really, really fascinating. And I actually really enjoyed Sarah Estep. Um, uh, I, I really enjoyed reading her research. Um, I, I thought she was quite an interesting character, actually. She was desperate to find something that would kind of explain to her that, you know, there was life after death. But I don't, I think uh, she still approached things with like a bit of a kind of scepticism. Of course, I think she kind of 
dropped that as her research went on but but I think she started from a, a quite a genuine place um and I really enjoyed reading her research I thought it was I thought it was refreshing after reading Jurgensen and, and Raudave who who kind of just went straight you know balls deep like straight into it headlong I found Sarah Estep's work to be quite a bit more interesting to read from that perspective but there's just say so to, to go back to it so I just I just can't believe it I think it's very funny how Raudave went really into how you need training you need to train your ear because it's so difficult and the way he justified it was that because it's ghosts and this they're speaking from the afterlife it must of course be difficult to understand what they're saying not just the fact that it, it's so hard to understand what they're saying because you're creating that from nothing, which which is a far simpler explanation to me. But there you go. Uh, Say, so I I really wasn't interested in in, in EVPs really from a a, um, a perspective of ever fun, being proven that it's right. I think I, I'm far too gone down that road of skepticism. The only thing that would probably turn my head now would have to be phenomenal. Like it would have to be an exceptional example of an EVP and it would have to be something else with a lot of proof behind it. You know, I'm not your regular EVP that just makes a noise is is, is probably not going to do it for me. So but you know, like it, it was still interesting and I really enjoyed doing it. So um you know I hope I hope you enjoyed listening to it. If 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 you um you know uh practice evp and and you think i'm i'm you know making all this up or or you know talking nonsense or you disagree feel free to get in touch um i say i hope i hope you think that i you know did some justice to your hobby with the you know speaking about raudave and, and jurgensen say I, I genuinely so i don't believe evps myself but I, I genuinely found it interesting and fascinating and their work was really great um you know their books I, you know i love the fact that they exist um so yeah um but anyway, get in touch with me if you want to. Uh, contact at darkhistories.com is the email address. You can also find uh, me on social media, um, pretty much all the social medias, and you can find all the links to that in the show notes and on the website at darkhistories.com. You can also find um, ways there to support and join in in the community on the Discord server and things like that if you would like to. And of course, you can contact me there as well. Thanks very much for listening. I'll be back in a couple of weeks uh, and so yeah I'll, I'll see you then until then take care and sleep tight